حمد حقه كما يستحقه حمدا كثيرا الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله اللهم العن أول ظالم ظلم حق محمد وآل محمد وآخر تابع له على ذلك اللهم العن العصابة التي جاهدت الحسين وشايعت وبايعت وتابعت على قتله اللهم العنهم جميعا ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين هم لأماناتهم وعهدهم راعون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم Just before we begin Everyone that's um, seated in the center If we can move forward um, رحم الله من ذكر, ال- ذكر القائم من آل محمد Last night we discussed amana and trust The second part of this verse Revolves around Fulfilling the Ahid. Now, what is Ahid? You'll find that Ahid branches of trust. Because as you have been entrusted with something, you are entrusting someone's belief with your word. So Ahid is you have come to agree with someone on something and you've come to an agreement on this thing and by coming to an agreement on this thing both of you whether it's a promise or of its like this is called ahad 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 afwan so anyway so generally in the english translation of this world word they would write promise Because it is a form of a promise. It is an agreement and it is a covenant as we will explain as we move along. When it comes to promises in general, you know, people always say promises like rules are meant to be broken. People say stuff like that. Why? Because of the way that we are used to life. Whenever a politician gets up and makes promises, everyone knows that this politician, when he gets into office will break these promises. You know, in our time, there was a politician called Dr. John Hewson who wanted to move up and become the Prime Minister. He went up for election and he wanted to introduce the goods and services tax, the GST. And on this basis, he wasn't elected. Then the next election, the Liberal government bought John Howard. And John Howard said... We will never introduce the GST. And that was one of his promises that he campaigned with. And lo and behold, the moment he got into office, he introduced the GST. So we're used to politicians saying things and not upholding their promise and not fulfilling their promise. But we know that a person's worth is their word. A man is as good as his word. People give you value, and they devalue you based on what your word is. But if you look at all the promises and all the uh, agreements and contracts, the most important one is the one that you make with you and Allah Azza wa Jal. And thus the word that is used when we speak about a contract or an agreement or a promise or a ahd that is made between you and Allah Azza wa Jal, we generally call it in English a covenant. It's a binding agreement between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. The problem is when people make an agreement with Allah, this is the agreement they take the lightest. And proof of this is if you strong arm someone, they usually turn. If you want something from someone, alaykum salam, and they know that you can physically overpower them, 
or they know you have the connections to get what you want from them, generally, they what? They don't resist what you do. They become subservient to what you ask them to do. However, if your threat is Allah, I remember one man told me that he went into business with someone and he said, we were buying building supplies and things started to go missing. He said, so I said to my partner, I said, there are things that are missing, building supplies that are starting to go missing. He said, do you know anything about it? And he said, no. He said, but this guy seemed like a nice person, but the way he replied, I could sense, uh, you know, I could sense shadiness about this person. Something just wasn't right. So he said, if you have anything to do with the building supplies disappearing, you will not be very happy. So he turned around, he said, and said to him, what do you mean I won't be very happy, you know? What's your threat? Who do you know? Who are you going to bring to deal with? It? He said, you, I will stand with you on the day of judgment over this. He said, if that's the case, Basita, I took them. This was his reply. He said, if that's the case, if it's a day of judgment, I took them. I thought you were going to get the mafia on me. I thought you were going to get some gang to beat me up. But if it's only God, then... However... People do this because they think Allah Azza wa Jal will not do anything about it because Allah delays. If you read in the dua on the Laylatul Jum'ah, where in this dua that you read, Man wa that dua that you read on Friday night, he says, وَقَدْ عَلِمْتُ He says that in the du'a, the Imam says that I know أَنْ لَيْسَ فِي حُكْمِكَ ظُلْمُ وَلَا فِي نَقِمَتِكَ عَجَلَ That when you judge, you do not use oppression. And when you take revenge, O oh Allah, you do not rush to take revenge. And then he says, why? Because he says, إِنَّمَا يَعْجَلُ مَنْ يَخَافُ الْفَوْتِ who rushes to take revenge? Someone that thinks they're going to miss the opportunity. وَإِنَّمَا يَحْتَاجُ إِلَىٰ الظُّلْمِ الضَّعِيفِ وَقَدْ تَعَالَيْتَ عَنْ ذَلِكَ عُلُوًّا كَبِيرًا That the only one that uses oppression is the one that is weak. And the one that immediately takes revenge or punishes is the one that thinks the opportunity will be missed. Ya yuhal insan innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan fa The end of the day, all of you are returning to Allah. So Allah gives you this mihli, He gives you this time so you can repent. Because when the day comes, there's no turning back. Even if you ask Allah to return you, it's too late. It's the time for judgment to be passed. Time for the punishment to take place. And this is why people take, when we mention Allah and your agreement with Allah, people take this lightly because they see, well, nothing's happening. But there are things happening as we will move along. Allah Azza wa Jal has made this mithaq with us, this agreement with us, and we'll explain how. When he says in the Quran, he says, وَأَوْفُوا بِعَهْدِ أُوفِي بِعَهْدِكُمْ Firstly, fulfill, he says, my agreement with you, so that I may fulfill this agreement also. In other words, do what I asked you to do, so I give you paradise. In other words, do not fear anyone but me, because everyone else is weak. Every single creation on this planet is weak. Allah is the only mighty one. Why? What's the worst someone can do to you? You say someone can kill me. For example, this guy was in a courtroom and he's about to be sentenced to death. So then he starts to raise his voice and shout. 
So the judge goes, order in the court or else I'll hold you in contempt of my court. He said, what are you going to do? Shoot me in the head twice? I'm already sentenced to death. What are you going to do now? In other words, you can't kill someone twice. Once they're dead, they're dead. Allah Azza wa Jal is the one that gave you life. Allah says you were non-existent, you were dead, he brought you to life. Then he takes life, then he gives you life. And then unto him you shall return. And this process can take a numerous amount of time with Allah. It's, an, it's a perpetual, it's an eternal process. Allah can give you life and he can take life away from you. And this is why only Allah Azza wa Jal should you fear. Hala, we say there's a, if there's a ta'ahud with Allah, we've, we've made a mithaq with Allah, an agreement. People will turn around and say, um, when did we agree to these conditions? At what point did we agree to these conditions? Because doesn't there have to be an agreement? We spoke yesterday about a trust. I can't just turn up at your house and drop off an item without your knowledge and then turn up to you the next day and say listen I left something in your house um, can you bring it for me and, uh, and, and you turn around and say what did you leave at my house we didn't agree to this it's gone missing we didn't agree to this you don't have to return it to me because there was no agreement likewise with the Ahad with this agreement this promise this agreement that you have between the two people there must be what there must be a consensus between the two that you've both agreed. Between the two that you've agreed that you and this person or you and this individual or you and this entity has agreed upon this. When did you and Allah Azza wa Jal come to an agreement? The first time that you came to an agreement is a time when none of you remember. Because Allah Azza wa Jal upon creating the souls, Allah Azza wa Jal that he made them testify when he said Alastu bi rabbikum, qalu bala. he said am I not your Lord and they said yes now no one here remembers this because this was upon the creation however the result of this is within us because we have what's called a fitra we have this burning desire this need to belong and this is why, and the, the proof of this, if people don't worship Allah Azza wa Jal, they worship other individuals. This is why they call a sports star, or an actor, or, a, or the fans refer to them as what? As idols. Why do they refer to them as idols? Because like they are a substitute for God. This is something that they turn to. And, and, and they prove this. If, if you notice sometimes you watch a sport, sporting event, you will see the crowd sometimes uh, offer like prostration action towards one of the players that's playing. And they refer to them, as you've seen some players are referred to. Remember there was uh, Gary Ablett that played for the Ge Geelong, Geelong Cats. In the AFL they used to call him what? His nickname was God. Or that, what was his name? Bart Cummings, the, what was it, Bart Cummings, the famous horse trainer. They used to call him what? God. That was their nickname. This is their nicknames that they would give them. They would idolize certain individuals, and they would, they would use terms because they don't know what else to use to substitute for God. And even I've mentioned this many times, the the project for Dr. Michael Persinger the uh, the Corin helmet which is they called it the God helmet which is a helmet it's on YouTube you watch this video it's it's a process that he puts on people's heads where they can feel at ease and he says I have made this machine this contraption to make up for the fact that the human needs to link to something out there you know we don't know what it is why the human you know, through natural selection has come to this, yeah. Why the human has ended up like this, but we can substitute for it. So there is this fitra, this is because we know there is a creator. However, people say, hold on, 
But I didn't agree to this. I don't remember agreeing to this. And we do not believe in compulsion. La ikraha fid din. You cannot be compelled to be a Muslim. Nowhere in the world are you allowed to force someone to follow religion. There's no compulsion in you agreeing on this. And thus, with the unbeliever, if the unbeliever becomes a Muslim, he doesn't have to do qada for all the prayers that he hasn't prayed. Why? Because he had not made this agreement. So what point do I actually make this agreement with Allah? We have people that are mentally unstable. They're not accountable for their actions. People that are insane, that they don't know what they're doing. They're not accountable for the actions. And then we have the issue of those that we call mustad'afin. People that they say at no point Islam would have reached them. There's no way someone would know about Islam. But that's not our issue. Our issue is our souls. At what point did you and I make a ahad with Allah Azza wa Jal? The point is once you recognize Allah exists. And once you recognize and know that God exists and know that everything on this earth is His, then you have to accept this because this is the condition to living on this earth. One man came up to Abu Abdullah Hussein alayhi salam and asked him, he said, I want to disobey God. I don't want to accept this. So the Imam gave him several conditions. He said, find a place that Allah does not own, you know, a place that's not God's, and then disobey God there. Breathe other or, or, or enjoy the subsistence or the sustenance on this earth that's not from Allah, and then disobey Allah all you want. He named several things. He says, do this, do that. Go somewhere where God cannot see you and disobey Him. Freely, everything he puts there. In other words, when you recognize that you are here and you are living in Allah's world, just as you were born, take a look. This is something no one ever questions. You're born here, you're born in Sydney, Australia. Okay? And there's laws here. You can't get up and say to the Australian government, listen, I don't want to really follow these laws. I. Uh, I want to jump in the car and, and speed at, as much as I want. I want to jump around wherever I want. I want to enter uh, places that you have said restricted. Can you do that? You can't. Why? They tell you, listen, you're living here. We are the people running this place. And if you want to live here, you must abide by our laws. And if you don't want to live here, you see this all the time, mate. Don't like it, leave it. You hear it all the time. This is the way it is. Wherever you go in the world, it's not in Australia, anywhere in the world, if you do not abide by the laws, you've got the option. You know, you've got the Indian Ocean, you can jump and swim in. You've got the Pacific Ocean, you've got the Tasman Sea, you can go anywhere you want. However, there are laws. Allah Azza wa Jal. When you give anyone the option, they want to enjoy the na'am of Allah. Now sometimes people try and tell you, look, I do not believe God exists. You see this all the time. He say, Allah Azza wa Jal, when he mentions this, he says, وَجَحَدُوا بِهَا and What does he say after this? They disobeyed, sorry, they, um, they rejected Allah Azza wa Jal existing. كَفَرُوا بِاللَّهِ but then he says, وَاسْتَيْقَنَتْهَا أَنفُسُهُمْ Now, if you look at this verse, it's so beautiful because it explains everyone around you. He says, وَاسْتَيْقَنَتْهَا أَنفُسُهُمْ ظُلْمًا وَعُلُوَّةً The only reason they reject Allah Azza wa Jal is due to ظلم, oppression, and عُلُوَّة because of haughtiness. Pride, self-conceit. And you can see this, it's evident. The example I gave many times, I've, I bought this example, the Richard Dawkins example, when Richard Dawkins was asked, what would you do if you found out God exists? 
he gets asked that question. And he said, one of my colleagues has asked me this question before. He said, what if there is proof, there is no doubt, but God exists, what would you do? He said, straight out, he said, I would not believe in him because I hate him. In other words, there is within them this belief that he does exist. Why do they reject Allah? Allah uses a verse, he says, Dhulman, he says, because of oppression and uluwa, he says, haughtiness. Number one, if I recognize that God exists, there's a big issue here. When you recognize God exists, you have to recognize everything you have is from Him. So, the world's strongest man, Brian Shaw, has to admit that my strength is from Allah. I'm not the strongest man because I train the hardest, but it's from Allah. Allah has given me this. The world's most, or they say intelligent man, the highest IQ, Stephen Hawking's, has to admit that my brain functions in this way and I can, you know, the guy's got some freaky things. The guy can do um, many equations within his head, nuclear physics equations within his head. Immediately he gives the answer. We could say based on this, Allah Azza wa Jal is the one that gave him the intellect. Now the problem is firstly, that they have to concede that Allah Azza wa Jal gave him this knowledge. This is their first problem. The second problem is what? This is mentioned um, in one of um, uh, Sayyid Dastagheb's books. It's a very important point. He says the other re reason why they refuse to acknowledge that Allah exists, because then they have taklif. No one wants to have obligations. Because the moment you recognize you are a slave, you have to see what your master wants. And so I pretend God doesn't exist. I try and ignore this even though I know he does. So then I'm not obligated to do anything. So I walk blindly on the earth. So once that I've recognized Allah Azza wa Jalla exists, I am under obligation to see what he wants. And this is where the contract comes in. If you take a look at your life, have you ever had this customer, anyone that works in any shop or anyone that does a service, you get a customer that walks in, and the first thing they walk in, they say, um, you know, I went to this other company, a company that does the same work you do, and he says, you know what, they're real thieves. The moment this customer walks in, I automatically identify this guy does not want to pay. This is where they begin. The people that don't intend on paying you, they always start by bagging the other company. Why? Because they don't want to pay. They're looking for a way out. From the very beginning, the ones that sit there and negotiate and are persnickety and meticulous to, you know, they're above per perfection, you know. Sometimes the work can be done at 99%, 98%. No one does anything at 100%. Nothing's perfect. You can't do anything perfect. But these people that are persnickety, these ones that are really scrupulous with the way that they, um, uh, they really peruse everything that you work on, they are the ones that usually are looking for a way. They're looking for a loophole so they don't have to pay. And the ones that question all these weird and wonderful questions, they do this deliberately so they don't have to worship. If you take a look, the people that want to get out of doing religious obligations, they have to come up first to you and they say to you, look, I don't trust any of the ulama. Uh, all these ulama, I don't trust. And you say, oh, look, can you please tell me, begin with, like I was talking, what evidence do you have on these ulama that you don't like? Name me one and tell me what evidence do you have. They just don't want to pray. They don't want to fast. They don't want to pay the hukuk. Say so they look for an excuse to get out. Even though we are told, between one another to give 70 excuses for our Muslim brother. Someone we don't know living on the other side of the world, we don't even make half an excuse for them and we believe everything everyone says about them. Just so that we can avoid what is our taklif. And this is why people come up with this form of picking holes so they do not have to fulfill the agreement with Allah. 
Firstly, Amir al-Mu'minin, and I'll explain this, says in a narration, he says, Man aslaha ma baynahu wa bayna Allah, aslaha Allahu ma baynahu wa bayna al-nas. If you fix your covenant and your agreement with Allah, Allah will fix your relations with people. And then he says, وَمَنْ أَصْلَحَ أَمْرَ أَخِرَتِهِ أَصْلَحَ اللَّهُ لَهُ أَمْرَ دُنْيَا If you fix your hereafter, Allah will fix your dunya. So in other words, I put all my affairs in Allah's hands. Some people deal in a certain way or act in a certain way because they think this is the only way to get ahead. For example, a drug dealer. A drug dealer wants to deal drugs because he wants to make a quick dollar. And then when he's made all his money with drugs, I see a lot of people, they make money with drugs. They've built their house with drugs. They've got their business with drugs. And then he says, Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayh. Mate, your whole life has been built with other people's suffering. One man wept and wept and wept and wept and said, Oh Allah, forgive me. And he kept weeping and weeping. Nabi Musa alayhi salam passed by him, then he asked Allah, he said, Oh Allah, this man weeping, will you forgive him, this man that is weeping? And Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ya Musa, go tell this man that if he cries until he dies, I will not forgive him. Listen to this hadith. If he cries until he dies, I will not forgive him. Because he says, مَا فِي بَطْنِهِ حَرَامٌ وَعَلَى ظَهْرِهِ حَرَامٌ وَفِي بَيْتِهِ حَرَامٌ He is consumed, his life is consuming what is not permissible. This does not mean this man eats pork necessarily. This means this man earns a dirty dollar and he buys things with this dirty dollar. And he consumes things with this dirty dollar. This is another way of eating haram. And his clothing is either stolen or purchased with haram. And in his house, this could mean what his property is, or even his wife may be taken in haram. Some people, they fornicate with someone. And these stories happen. They will fornicate with a married woman. And then when she gets divorced, he will marry her, even though she becomes forbidden on him till the day of judgment. He can never marry her, but he'll marry her, have children with her, and they both say, Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu. Let's start again. People deal in this manner because they will say this is the only way. You know, whenever you go to the Middle East, when I first went there, a lot of people say this, you can't live here without lying. You, they knew, you need to be dishonest to live here. That's a lie. In itself, that is a lie. You don't need to be dishonest anywhere. You're dealing with God. And Allah sends Wulad al Halal to you. Don't worry. You'll get a lot of bad apples, but you'll pick them as they turn up. And situations work out because Allah will make them work out. All our problems come from what? Reneging on the deal. Our problems come from the nakis of the ahd we have made with Allah. If you take a look at doing this in your life, what it has done for us as humans on this earth. Allah Azza wa Jal, when He speaks in the Quran, He says, وَضُرِبَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الذِّلَّةِ وَالْمَسْكَنَةِ وَبَاءُ بِغَضَبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يَكْفُرُونَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَيَقْتُلُونَ النَّبِيِّينَ بِغَيْرِ الْحَقِّ ذَلِكَ بِمَا عَصَوْ وَكَانُوا يَعْتَدُونَ if you look at this verse, it's consequentially reversed. <laughs> Just so you can bear with me. If you look at the consequences, Allah Azza wa Jal says, we'll look at it in reverse. This is because of that, is because of that. Firstly, ذَلِكَ بِمَا عَصَوْ وَكَانُوا يَعْتَدُونَ Because the people disobeyed, and they transgressed, and they aggressed, Allah Azza wa Jal, what did they do? This is where they began with. 
Firstly, they disobeyed. They went against God's law. They went against this binding contract with Allah. They would kill an Nabiyina bi ghayri haq. They would kill the prophets. They would deny Allah. Yaqfuruna bi ayatillah. Wa yaqtuluna an Nabiyina bi ghayri haq. This is what happens when you start to sin. When you start to sin, eventually you don't believe in anything anymore. This is when all the doubt arrives in your head. They arise in your head, all these doubts from this. And then Allah says, the beginning of this is what happens to you on this earth because of all this. He says, وَضُرِبَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الذِّلَّ وَالْمَسْكَنَةِ They become what? He says, they were covered in humiliation and poverty. You don't have to be poor to live in poverty. Sometimes people are rich and live in poverty. How often do you go to a rich person's house that lives in poverty? A lot of times you enter people's houses and you know, the second you walk in, they're always worried about, oh, they tell you, you know what? You enter, honestly, I've been in houses that are, are expensive and a person starts whinging about their financial difficulties. That's what they do. They say, oh, I'm doing it really tough. You know, I blew a tire in the Ferrari. What do you want me to do? Yeah, they they live a life of poverty, although that they are rich. But it begins with giving up this mithaq with Allah. So shall break in the ahad, the agreement you have with Allah that you will do good on this earth. And this is the ultimate promise, more than any other promise that you can make. All these Excuses we make to sin a trickery and deception from the shaitan. They're all excuses in the end. Remember I mentioned that we have concessions in Islam. And these concessions in Islam are what? These concessions are given by Allah Azza wa Jal for certain things. We mentioned prayers, you're given a concession. Fasting, you're given a concession. People, for example, will break these rules because they say this is the only way I can do this. Look, the only way that I can relieve this sexual strain I have on me is to talk to a person of the opposite gender and break the laws. There's no excuse. Iblis is the one that gives you this excuse and he says in the Quran and he mentions the word Ahad Allah Azza wa Jal he says Ya'iduhum Afwan he uses Wa'ad the word Wa'ad here the promise of the devil he says Ya'iduhum wa yumannihim okay wa ma yu'iduhum ash-shaytan illa ghurura Ya'iduhum firstly he promises them wa yumannihim he arouses them on this that you know what Allah will let you go. You're doing it tough. You know, here they tell you, you're living in Australia. You're surrounded by all these things that can make you commit sin. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. And this is every country in the world uses this excuse. Every country you go to Africa, people say, yeah, we're poor. It's not my fault I'm doing this. You know, um, I've only got one car. I need two cars. It's not my fault that I'm stealing. It's not my fault I purchase stolen products. It's not my fault. They start making excuses for their actions. This is a deceptive way that Iblis promises you that you will get out. But what you need to understand, this agreement you've made with Allah, if it is not fulfilled, the way that you agreed with Allah Azza wa Jal, there are ramifications in this world and the hereafter. Firstly, Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, وَأَوْفُوا بِالْعَهْدِ إِنَّ الْعَهْدَ كَانَ مَسْؤُولًا that there is awful bil ahd is just, Allah shows here. In another verse it says, وَكَانَ عَهْدُ اللَّهِ مَسْؤُولًا He shows that you are accountable and you will be questioned on the day of judgment for your uhud. Whether these uhud you make are between you and people, promises between you and people, agreements between you and people, whether it is the ultimate promise between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. Even when we look at the issue of bay'ah, giving allegiance. What is bay'ah? It is a form of ahd. When you give allegiance, this is why we say nakath al-bay'ah. 
that when someone breaks the bayat, they have broken this promise, this agreement between them and the Imam. Inni ujaddidu fi sabihati yawmi hadha. What's the first word we say? When we read dua al-ahd between you and the Imam Sahib al-Amr. Ajallah faraj al-Sharif sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. It is a ahd. You are renewing every morning this agreement between you and Allah through the master that's on the earth that Allah has delegated. Allah when he speaks about the ahd, he says, وَالْمُوفُونَ بِعَهْدِهِمْ إِذَا عَاهَدُوا In the verse where he says, لَيْسَ البر. You want to know who the righteous are? Of the list, he says, the ones that fulfill this promise. You have fulfilled the promise between them and Allah Azza wa Jal, between them and people, people that don't break their word. They are the righteous. Allah says, Bala man awfa bi ahdihi wa taqa fa inna Allah yuhibbul muttaqeen. That the one that fulfills this commitment, fulfills the promise, fulfills the word, and is righteous, Allah loves these people. That Allah prefers these people over others. In fact, remember we said that there is no concession last night when it comes to returning trust. There is no concession for three things, the narration says. You have no concession for three things. Three things you have to deal with everyone the same. Number one is when someone entrusts you with something, you must return this. Number two, when you make a promise with someone, you must fulfill it. Be this person a good person or a bad person. And number three, which is another discussion altogether, is being good to the parents. Your parents could be despicable. You know, some people, they've got rotten parents. They do. Not everyone has good parents. Some people have got rotten parents. Are you supposed to be bad to them? No, you have to be as good as possible. You have to be good to your parents because this is what Allah has said. Even if your parent is an unbeliever, even if your parent is against Islam, someone that talks, you could have a parent that talks against Islam. Your mother could be Pauline Hansen. You still have to be good to her. Doesn't matter who your parent is, you have to be good to them because this is what Allah Azza wa Jal has asked you to do. Even the treaty that was made with the polytheists. Allah says, المشركين, When he's speaking about the promise, the ones that you have made an agreement with, a treaty with the mushrikeen, you have to fulfill it. Taban, the verse is much longer, but I want to try and, and round up these verses. But then Allah speaks about the majority of people. He says, break these promises. وَمَا وَجَدْنَا لِأَكْثَرِهِمْ مِنَ مِنْ عَهْدٍ وَإِنْ وَجَدْنَا أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَفَاسِقِينَ That when it comes to this covenant and this agreement, most people break their word. Why? He says most people are disobedient. They don't like to keep their word. There's something wrong with them keeping their agreement. And but what Allah says here about the people that break the agreement or break their word or their agreement with Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Alladina ahadta minhum, thumma yanqudun ahadahum fi kulli mark marratin wahum la yatakun. The people that you have made a treaty with, an agreement with, they do not fear God if they break it. These people that break it are people that do not fear God because there's the accountability. Once again, we go back to the crux of our discussion, success and loss. Those that break their word. Those that break their covenant, that break their agreement between them and Allah, they are the losers on the Day of Judgment. They are the ones that are lost on the Day of Judgment. If we look at the prime example, when it comes to people that break the agreement, you look in the Quran, it shows you 
the Israelites, Banu Israel. If you look at through their stories throughout, Allah Azza wa Jal says to them, وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِيثَاقَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ that Allah Azza wa Jal made a covenant with them. He made an agreement with them. He said to them, لَا تَعْبُدُونَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا This is the agreement he made with them. If you take a look, when we look at the Ten Commandments, this was the agreement. They didn't have to get up and pray five times a day. They didn't have to fast Shah Ramadan, Al-Mubarak. They had certain rules that they put upon themselves, certain different they had different conditions, but the main laws were these commandments that Allah Azza wa Jal gave. After all this, He says to them, ثُمَّ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِّنْكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ مُعْرِضُونَ Only a small amount of you did not turn away. But the majority of you did. The majority of you break, broke this covenant. How? Let's just take a look, quick examples. We started late, so don't worry about the time. If we take a look at quick examples, number one, these people were living under the slave, they were under the bondage and slavery of Pharaoh. They were used and abused to do all this work for Pharaoh. Allah Azza wa Jal saved them with Nabi Musa. And when he brought them to the Red Sea, you read the narrations, you know, when you read the verses in the Quran or you read the historical text, it just tells you that Moses split the sea. Nabi Musa, ala nabina wa alihi wa alayhi afdal as salatu wa salam, he split the sea. He split the sea and the people crossed. You look at the narrations, they're different. It's more technical than this. This is how patient, you want to know what were the most patient beings on the earth, the representatives of God, the Anbiya, and the Awsiya were the most patient creations I have ever seen. I cannot even fathom how patient they were. No one can. You cannot even understand the patience of these creations. He came to the Red Sea. The army of Pharaoh is coming towards them. They're going to kill them all. And Allah commands him to cross the sea. So the righteous ones... Yusha ibn Nun, Joshua, and one or two others of the righteous ones, they jump on their horses and they start to walk on the water. Musa says, return. They come back. He says, Banu Israel will drown. He said, you guys, you're a different level. If you walk, you'll cross the water. But these people, they'll drown. They won't be able to cross the water. So then, he asks Allah Azza wa Jal, through the authority that Allah has given him, he splits the sea. Imagine you're standing in front of the Red Sea. When you talk to the Red Sea, if you someone cut open the, uh, what's it called, that canal down there, I'd be excited. Imagine the Red Sea. You're talking about a big body of water. A massive body of water being opened. It's, it's wider than, it's one of the widest bodies of water that is considered a sea, not an ocean. He stands there, this is, um, when I say, it's not, sorry, it's not one of the widest bodies, consider, but considered, considering the other bodies of water that you see around you, it is very wide. He stands there and he splits it open and they say, stop. Oh Musa, we're 12 tribes. We can't walk next to each other, the chiefs of the tribes. And he says, what do you want? They say, split 12 channels for us. Because each tribe cannot walk with the other tribe. You know, most of us would have said, hold on, I've got a magic stick here. See you later. You, t you, you would take action immediately. Nabi Musa splits 12 channels and they say, stop. They say, when we walk through, this is where Instagram and Facebook all came along. They say, we want the others to see us walking through water. So through the channels, can you make windows, like openings, where they can see us as we walk through? Nabi Musa commanded and so be it after all this they get to the other side and the first thing they do upon him leaving them he says to them oh, I'm going to leave you for 30 nights when he leaves Allah Azza wa Jal says you stay here for another what mamnahum Allah Azza wa Jal increased them by 10 days why 
Allah wants to test them. He disappeared an extra 10 days. What will they do? After all they've seen, what will they do? So then they start to worship the golden calf. Covenant after covenant. Sorry, uh, a break after break within the covenant that they do. They keep on break. Allah Azza wa Jal always when they turn back forgives them. Every single thing they do, He forgives them. But if you look at the suffering that they suffered because of this and those that died and they have the eternal suffering, it's all because they agreed to something and they broke it. Those that make an agreement on anything, not only will they be punished in the dunya, sorry, in the akhirah, but they'll be punished in the dunya before the akhirah. وَالَّذِينَ يَنْقُضُونَ عَهْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مِيثَاقِهِ وَيَقْطَعُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَنْ يُوصَلْ وَيُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمُ اللَّعْنَ وَلَهُمْ سُوءُ الدَّارِ So the first verse I read about this same verse says that Allah Azza wa Jal says to them, he says, أُولَٰئِكَ الْخَاسِرُونَ That they are losers. In this verse, he says Allah curses them. He damns them and they will have the worst abode. On the Hira, they will have the Nar of Jannam for breaking this ahad between them and Allah. This ahad that you have made, this agreement that you have made with Allah. This is the purpose of listening to these majlis. Taban, there is reward in these majlis. Attending these majlis, listening to the majlis, crying in the majlis, doing latum in the majlis, involving yourself in the sha'a'ir of Abu Abdullah al Hussein are all of utmost importance. Cooking, cleaning, donating, all these things have reward. But if these nights finish, just like the people that go to the Hajj, just like the people in Shah Ramadan, if these nights finish and you're the same person that came on the first night, then they were all a waste for you. You have to decide here. This is what you're here for. You have to decide where will I stand. Right now, this is between you and yourself. Where do you think you will stand if you were in Karbala? Would you stand behind the jama'ah of Umar ibn Sa'ad or would you stand behind the jama'ah of Imam Hussain? Don't answer it with your words. Look at how you are when it comes to sin. Are you someone that sins immediately? Then you will stand behind Umar ibn Sa'ad. If you are someone that he rushes to your prayers, rushes to good deeds, looks where a good deed is, you will stand behind Abu Abdullah al-Hussain. You know by your actions. When someone asked Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, he said, how do I know what my position is in the eye of Allah? You want to know? It's no secret. It's not a lotto. You haven't bought your tickets and you'll know the result on the day of judgment. You know the result now. Do you want to know where you are in the eyes of Allah? Every single one of you, I can tell you right now where you are. How? He gives you a measuring. A yeah, that's what the word imam means. Imam means yardstick. He's the, what you measure yourself by. The measurement that you use, Imam Ali salam says, look at how you are when it comes to sin. The quicker you are to, to committing sin, then you are nothing in the eyes of Allah. The further you are when it comes to committing sin, then you are great in the eyes of Allah. The summer's coming along. The people that are going to be spending their times in mixed gatherings musical environment I don't have to not drink sorry I don't have to drink to be evil I have to be present where drinks available alcohol is available where will I be this is where I will be on the day of judgment this is something for you to reflect over these people that went with Imam Hussein alayhi salam they were chosen they were selected don't think you'll have the tawfiq to stand with the Imam Sahib al-Amr. A tattoo of 313 will not get you with the Imam. This is not your ticket to go to the Imam. I'm not bagging people that have these tattoos. That's their prerogative. They can do what they want. But what I'm saying, this isn't your ticket for the Imam. The Imam wants a contrite heart. 
He wants a pure heart. People that can take a stand. Not everyone takes a stand. You think, you think that these people in the world around you take stand. People that are fighting today in the world. It's only a select few. You know, sometimes we look at and we go, MashaAllah, everyone's fighting. It's only a select few. If you take a look at the people fighting the Dawaish, it's only a select few that are fighting. The rest around the borders, moving around, it's only the people with the righteous hearts. Not everyone tells you I'm going to fight has got that pure heart to begin with. Not everyone that tells you that they are in these positions has this pure heart. The pure heart that will stand with Imam Sahib Al-Amr is a heart that is at peace with Allah Azzawajal. It's a heart that abstains from Maharam Allah. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to forgive us our sins in these nights. We ask Allah not to take us from this place that we are seated right now unless He returns us to our homes as if the day that our mother gave birth to us with our deeds mudaf, inshallah, our good deeds. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal bihaq Aba Abdullah al Hussein because you are fortunate. You have been selected to listen to his majlis, to be in any of the majlis. Any majlis that's taken place for Abu Abdullah around the world, you are fortunate. While you are here, do dua for one another. That Allah forgives your sins and Allah accepts your actions and does not take you from this world. Illa wa huwa rad alaykum insha'Allah. Bi barakat al-salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.